Good afternoon. <clears throat> I think uh, Sam has covered everything in such detail that uh, my presentation could, might as well, I could, you know, I could just as well skip it. But a boss of mine in Unilever used to say many years ago that there is a something common between butter, budgets, and knowledge or gyan as he called it. He says the lesser you have, the more you spread. So with that uh, thing in mind, I think the little that I know about out of home, I will share with you today. Uh, presentations broadly in two parts. The first part I'll cover from an advertising continuum standpoint. I think Sam was making the same point. That it's rarely that people make decisions based on one kind of stimulus or consumption of one type of media. Usually that you are continuously getting stimulus from all nature of media, from a variety of channels, and much of that sinks to the back of your mind. And then when you are in the mode of making a decision, everything starts to come back to mind. And I have noticed, I began life uh, in 1999 with Hindustan Lever, and over the years I have noticed that I think deliberately uh, marketeers as well as agency partners have uh, overdone the rationale and the logical part of it. And I think they have uh, started giving, uh, I would say, secondhand treatment to the magic and the creativity uh, and the value of building grand ideas on a large canvas. So that's really what I'll attempt to do. Um, let's see now. Sam was mentioning Japan. Meanwhile, I'll figure out how to use this clicker. But uh, the only one occasion I had there, uh, if Japan is at 12% as Sam was mentioning, I would not be surprised if it's also the most technologically intensive out of home because if you are in any doubt try and use a flush toilet in a Japanese hotel room, you'll know you need to have a B-Tech and ComScience to be able to do that. Uh, excuse me, how do I... Ah, okay. Right. So the first thing I wanted to say was the oldest form of advertising that we encounter every day that's on all your tables is a flower. Pollinating flowers have been around for 30 million years and bees have been around for 30 million years as well. And the reason why evolution has created a flower is to be able to attract the bees so that they can get nectar and they pollinate. So the very reason there is a vast diversity of colors and of types of petals and of the, the combinations with which a flower emerges is actually advertising in its most pristine form. Now the question is what happens if a bee goes to a flower and discovers there is not much nectar there whereas they have done the job for pollination. Uh, the short answer is the bees will discover this and will stop going again. So no matter how grand and how attractive your advertising is, at the end of the day, it has to be a reciprocal arrangement. And so I think corporate life and human society in general is very similar to a beehive. And I think uh, pollinating flowers are the representation of what is attractive in advertising. But it's also that when there is an investment, there has to be a return. And this shortcut in terms of why targeting is important is... Uh, is again, like I said, we, we have over-rationalized and we have over-optimized for what has worked for us in the recent past. And we sometimes forget that, you know, the grandness of out of home, of which I have traditionally been a believer, is something that creates magic and it cannot be uh, decoded with logic. When I was a young uh, summer trainee in Hindustan Lever, I used to have a venerable group bond unionized salesman Bhagwan Singh, his name was, he was an ex-army man, which was a rarity. And in Bangalore, I was working on a project for Kisan. At the time, they had proliferated a number of brands, Tom Chi, Tom Imbli, and so on. And he told me that, you know, we should put large hoardings across Bangalore. And I was a freshly minted MBA, and I said, you know, why, why, it's not attribution, nahi hota hai, wagara, wagara. I told him something like that. He said, yes, but you see, you look up to the brand, and it's larger than life. And I think after so many years, I think back to what he told me and I think there is deep logic in what he was saying. Once the brand makes you look up to it, once there is grandness, 
I think a lot of what follows is just uh, decision science. Uh, there is a reason why we happily go to a restaurant, but we differ when we go to a handcart. Is because that upfront investment that they have made in putting together an air-conditioned hall, in hiring a chef and so on and so forth. But most of the times that I eat off a handcart or street food, actually turns out to be a lot tastier than what I get at large hotels. But the reason why your decision making is easy when it comes to large investments is because there is a commitment up front. And I see a few young men and women here. The same thing works when you're proposing, right? Try do it with a very small diamond and you will see upfront commitment signals the, the depth of the relationship and also that you intend to stick to it. So there is, there is some logic in the largeness of the medium. Okay, it's, it's going back for some reason. I need help with this. Just so that you think I'm not a Neanderthal, there is only one arrow and it points backwards, so I don't know what to do with it. They have abandoned me. All right, meanwhile, let me continue to talk to you about the other, the other part which I wanted to speak about was this, which is, you know, there is in the markets that are intensively contested for by out-of-home advertising, there is a superfluous amount of messaging that's happening at every available nook and cranny. So the point is, people very often say, uh, it may be effective, but it is not efficient. And here again, I've been thinking about this and I, I have a feeling that we firstly, very synonymously use these words conversationally. And secondly, we tend to rank efficiency above effectiveness because the marketer has to talk to the finance person, he has to talk to the salesperson, he has to show results. And to my mind, it is myopic to think about the short term efficiency at the cost of the larger effectiveness which may not work through in numbers. Let me give you an example. Uh, efficiency is a matter which can be downloaded onto an Excel sheet. And in our line of work, and I keep, some of my team members are here, I keep telling them, you should try and use effective jargon because the, the, the challenge with marketing is our business is done in sunshine and it's spoken in ordinary English. So the guy who comes with the Excel sheet intimidates everybody in the room saying, oh my God, he has all the results now and there is no way in which a creative logic, imagine trying to, uh, uh, you know, contest uh, an ROI which is detailed out to the last penny we spent with a storyboard. It doesn't work that way. And very often creative people have to go to rational people and get their sign off, but vice versa happens very rarely. Have you ever heard? you know, a, a CFO telling a finance person to go and say, I like your Excel sheet, but go to some creative people and bounce it off them and see what they say. I think some wacky ideas might help your return. It doesn't happen that way, it's a one-way road. And so therefore, efficiency has been rated much higher than effectiveness. And I think that is an incorrect posture to take. Why do I say that? Because when you are being efficient, you are forced to look to the past, you are forced to look to arithmetical model, you are looking at rational constructs, which logically everybody can solve for. So if logic was winning the battle and if magic was, you know, peripheral, then every logical person should build a great brand, but we know that that doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't happen in significant theatres of human activity. Say you were just to pick up on the example of romance, right? The most efficient way to go on a date is to go to a cheap restaurant to share the cab fare and uh, to talk about work, but that will not be a successful date because the effective way is to show commitment by making it a special evening. In, say, if you were in a battlefield and the most efficient way was to use a sniper, now uh, you have to be elevated, you have to be able to see the enemy, Instead, people rely on artillery bombardment, which isn't technically the most effective, uh, uh, the most efficient way of going about it, but it's effective because a sniper's bullet has to see you square in the eyepiece and hit you in the middle of your eyes. Whereas a bomb, if it's a big bomb and an idea is like a bomb, even if it lands two or three hundred meters here or there, it'll still do the job. So I think effectiveness has been compromised 
by this collusion or this overemphasis on rationalization. Impact advertising, to my mind, is a bit like that. If you see a lot of grand creative expression, it starts to sink to the back of your mind, but then it starts to crystallize there. And I have worked in Alcobev, I have worked in financial services and in FMCG. And all of those cases, um, you know, the time cycles and the decision frameworks may be different, but broadly, there is a deep evolutionary signature to this. What people, when people are unsure, they do two things. Either they continue to do things that they have known of in the past. So, you know, I had that green liquid and I didn't die. Green liquids are safe to consume. Or if on that given day I can't find a green liquid, then I look around me. And if everybody's having the purple liquid and surviving, then it's safe to have the purple liquid. So there is a large evolutionary logic to uh, going for things that are larger than life. Um, I was presenting recently to our board and I told them that when I get any kind of escalation from consumers, uh, they always write, I didn't think this could happen with Tata. So even though we are Tata Motors and commercial vehicles, conversationally they tell each other, Tata ki gadi. And so everything that they think positively about, uh, 155 years of leadership with trust, country building, integrity, pioneering, all of that distills through in every vehicle they are buying. And so it's a very important point that, you know, let's, let's go away from the microscope and start to look at things through a telescope. I got it now. I have understood what, what, what you need to do. Now the other thing is signaling and you know the, the, whole, the whole concept of dual audiences. It works in two ways. One is when I am not concerned, I am still an audience, member of the audience because it's addressing the universe. And the other is when I am the recipient of a message which is most relevant to me. And it happens to all of us, if you are looking to buy a car, all that you will see is car advertising. If you are looking to sell your apartment, all you are wanting to do is to find brokers or people who are wanting to buy an apartment. Now, the way it ladders up is those people who are not the directly interested audience but are in the universe, once they are immersively soaked in the idea that this is a brand worthy of respect, that it must be a big deal to them, which is why they are putting up hoardings everywhere, or it is a big deal to them, which is why I see the television ad reflected in print and then I see the print ad in a mutant way up on an outdoor hoarding, then that signals to them that you are serious contenders, that it is worthy of respect and trust. And trust building can happen only with largeness. You cannot. Um, let, let me give you a parallel example. When I, when I got married, <clears throat> my grandfather, who was a very social person in a feudal mindset in Rajasthan, for nine days before I got married, every day I had to accompany him to meet some old colonel or journal and, and he would go and say, you know, my grandson is getting married and you please come. And I said, you know, if you send them a card or make them a phone call, they'll still come. But he said, no, no, it, it tells them that we are delighted, it's an important social occasion and it is for social reciprocation. They came home when their children were getting married, it behoves upon me to go when you are getting married. And in this context, I was thinking about it uh, yesterday. You know, you don't go and get married at everybody's house. Yeah? My grandfather didn't say, Achha, ab aapke ghar aage, par bhi fere kara lete, and then we'll go to the next place. You get married at one place, you call everybody there. And that is the addressing of the universal set. And this is pretty similar to what advertising at scale is trying to achieve. And, you know, while I am an equal adorer of uh, digital advertising, I find that this measurement before creative is like putting the cart before the horse, in my opinion. Uh, and this is, by the way, not true only of advertising money. Any resource that is scarce, inside a company, if a brand matters to you, you will put the best people on it. Um, you know, if there is a scarcity of money, you will prioritize and ring fence that budget. If, if, if you find creative, uh, uh, you know, talent which can do humor uh, rarely, and if you, are, you know, if you are intending to do a very humorous line of advertising, it signals to people it matters to them. And that, that's what I think Out of Home achieves. Another thing that I wanted to 
and soon I will come to the out of home part which will then get done very quickly because like I said Sam has told you everything about it. You see in our line of work as a marketer I am saying this and it is true for advertising just as much. Uh, unlike economics or physics or many other lines where there are universal laws, in uh, marketing there are no universal laws. In fact very often in, in sciences they say it works in theory let's experiment and see if it works in practice. In marketing in my experience very often it turns out that what was not intended works out in practice and then you say hmm how the hell does this work in theory let me figure it out. And if you are doing that you are on to something good, you are on to something which others are not doing and you must put that under a microscope. Now imagery like I said all imagery all stimulus gets consciously absorbed but subconsciously triggered. In fact, after 24 years in this business, my belief is that consumers are by and large subconsciously driven and our active mind is like a lawyer. We are trying to, we are trying to post fact to rationalize why we took those decisions. And you know, if you look back in your life, if you are changing a geezer, uh, you will talk to people who have recently bought a, you might talk to your building superintendent, so on and so forth. But in decisions of which line of work to choose, uh, which company to join, uh, which person to marry, uh, you know, many, which holiday to take, many of these things are purely subconsciously suggested to you, which you then all your life consciously rationalize. Nini, I did this because of these reasons. The reasons are being suggested to you after the impulse has arrived. Now, let me pick up at random these examples. Let's take Life Boy. Uh, Life Boy, through the 20th century, more people in India had access to Life Boy, which was a leaky red colored carbolic soap, than had access to tap water or electricity or toilets. And frankly, it went from being a problem solution brand, a body odor brand, to being a germicidal soap, to being a mission brand, which is saving lives. Any soap that you wash your hands with will broadly do the same job. But it is because of the power of associations. For decades they ran Tandurusti Ki Raksha Karta Hai Life Boy, which is now preserved as a, as a musical uh, note at the end of their advertising. And it became an iconic brand and it remains an iconic brand. Let's take the case of Nespresso. <coughs> Can I get a bottle of water please? Uh, Nespresso, uh, which I discovered in some of my journeys abroad first, uh, if you take the coffee powder that Nespresso uses and if it was sold like a Nestle jar, I would certainly die of a heart attack given the kind of price it would be. But a Nespresso machine costs you 10 to 15,000 rupees and that pod, last that I checked, costs you about 80 to 100 rupees. So if you're having five cups of coffee over five years, the average price would be in the ballpark of 70 to 80 rupees a pod. Now your mental framework is comparing it to Starbucks or an expensive barista. And then you feel like, wow, you know, this is something which is great because the quality is not compromised and I'm actually ending up saving a hell of a lot of money. Take the case of Red Bull. If as a marketeer I was given a brief that we need to quickly take share from Coke or Pepsi, what would we have done if, if I made syndicates in this room and said I'll come back after half an hour, let's deliberate on how to take aggressive share gain from a Coke or Pepsi. I can bet you the sequencing may be different but broadly the answers would be make an excellent formulation that tastes better than Coke and Pepsi, give it at a price which is cheaper than Coke and Pepsi. Uh, and give it in a serving size which is higher than Coke and Pepsi. The rational mind will tell you, deliver greater value and deliver better quality. But Dietrich Mateschitz, who was a middle-aged Austrian tourist roaming around in Thailand, tasted what is hyper-caffeinated. Some people find it obnoxious. And he said, wow, I will license this product. He goes back to Western Europe, gives it in a can roughly half the size of Coke at a price roughly double the price of Coke or Pepsi. And since 1987, he has sold 100 billion cans. Last year, they sold 12 billion cans. They own a Formula One team. They made a man jump from space to Earth. If this was being done with logic, uh, you know, it wouldn't, done, it wouldn't get done. And a lot of this advertising rationalization works in exactly the same way. And I am not opposed to method purity. I am not opposed to return on investment. In fact, my life depends on it. But I am saying, 
between the short and the medium term and between the large term, between the immediate impact and the larger impact, we must own this dialogue and as marketeers, we must go to our management committees, to our boards and aggressively ask for doing the right thing. Last but not the least, uh, everybody knows this case, uh, you know, a copywriter and an art director at DDB got a brief for a small, awkward looking, ugly car which had a Nazi pedigree in post-war America. And this was a time when big was beautiful in America, you know, they used to sell the Lincoln Continental, the Cadillac and the Ford Thunderbird. And uh, Helmut Krone came up with think small. So they completely changed the dialogue on the category code. And sometimes when you are doing disruptive things, when you are doing things which are going against received wisdom, you need a canvas that can justify that splash or that impact. And I think Out of Home provides that. So now let me stick to my business. What are the problems in the commercial vehicles industry? It's a very large industry in India. It's, it's a bedrock of the economy. Every part you know, the, the LPG cylinders that you get at home, this water came to this hotel, the construction material that built this hotel, the carpeting, everything here arrived on, on the back of a commercial vehicle. Um, commercial vehicle businesses are highly rational. The consumers are business people. But our category has made a presumption that the consumer is only and only value driven. So they only think of specifications, comparisons, uh, they're only seeking return, which is not true. So soon after I came to this business, I told uh, one of my senior colleagues, I said, I've never seen in India somebody decorating their car, no matter how expensive that car is, with pool patti and with, you know, writing slogans on it. But you see any small commercial vehicle or a large commercial vehicle in India, after buying it, they will take it to a secondary market where they sell specialty stickers or there are artisans at work to decorate that vehicle. If they didn't have a deep emotional connect, why would they be doing that? Why would they be embellishing it? So the first category issue that we had is that over a period in time, the creative codes became a bit like tofu. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless. Everybody's tofu is the same as anybody else's tofu. So how do you break away? How do you pivot away from this? and make a larger impact happen. Secondly, in, in commercial vehicles, there are all modalities, business to consumer. So small con commercial vehicles are brought very, very similarly to passenger vehicles or to two wheelers. Then there is business to business, which is as you go up to larger fleets. And then there is business to business to consumers, take the case of vans or buses. So all three modalities are alive, but there is no singular way in which to advertise and appeal to them. So naturally you have to talk about the mother brand. So the reason why for me, out of home works is when you've displayed creatives with a difference, you break away from the category code, which is quite uh, precious. Uh, we are a large company. At last count, we were about 60 to 70,000 uh, crore or rupees top line. But within the business, there are several companies. So each one, small commercial vehicles, intermediate commercial vehicles, heavy commercial vehicles, passenger business, services, spare parts, and the digital businesses, all are housed within what is called, say, Tata Motors. And then we have, uh, you know, large numbers of managers who are in specific uh, professional streams. Engineering people think like engineers, design people think like designers, sales people think like sales people, but there is the need for a brand wraparound. So whose responsibility is that and how do we elevate all of this as a bundle, how do we elevate this to a magnificent brand? There again, I think advertising and particularly out of home advertising helps. And the best way in which to discover it, the best way in which to discover it is to go across. One of the issues with uh, consumer research and a lot of the, the post facto attribution research that Sam was referring to also is while you can compute the, whether you got your dollars worth, what consumers tell you, and I am a voracious consumer of research, so I believe in it, both qual and quant. But the fact is, how do you know what consumers tell each other? So we were in a positioning exercise for the last year and a half, and what we were increasingly paying attention to was what they tell each other. And what they tell each other is safe, secure statements, like you can't go wrong with this. 
and they are people who are standing at a NACA or at a union stand, 30, 40 of them, they have a majority presence of one brand. In our business, a brand, unlike a sachet of shampoo or a bowl of soup, doesn't come in and get added to the repertoire and drop off again. It stays for five, seven, ten years. So if a fleet owner buys two trucks of another brand, he will buy spare parts from that brand, he will go to their service center, <coughs> he will have an annual maintenance contract, his drivers will be trained on that brand and so on and so forth. So the stickiness of share is a very big deal. So we need to keep, uh, we need to keep investing in the brand, we need to keep growing the top line, which is where, uh, I'll skip the segmentation part, but it's important again from an out of home point of view, we talk about north market or east market or you know, where, are, where have we lost share to whom. But the fact is, only the proportions vary. There are people who are adorers of your brand or adopters of your brand or available to your brand in every geography, just the proportions are different. And marketing has over-invested, I'm saying generically, in the top right, where my brand aware intenders are also category intenders. That top right box is where all the energy is. For people who are category intenders but not brand aware, or for people who are brand aware but not really thinking of the category, we don't have stimulus that works them up. That key doesn't exist because all our plans are based on rational analysis of the top right. So we tried to do where does this sit uh, in the funnel, and in the funnel I believe it sits right on the top which is, do I know you? Are you big enough? Are you constantly beeping on my radar? Am I being able to look up to you the same way as 100,000 other people are? Because conversationally, brands, uh, they are democratic constructs, you know. And, um, you know, I, I'll just uh, take a leaf out of, uh, I think, what Anurag was saying, elections are approaching. I think politicians, by and large, are very acute marketeers. Uh, we, uh, all marketing can learn from how politicians change their narrative. And so while they're invested in digital, while they're doing a lot of, uh, you know, attribution rich and return specific media, there are still these rallies happening, there are still the outdoor hoardings happening, and they are uh, absolutely grounded in terms of having that consumer contact on a regular basis. Now, I don't have time left, so what I'll do is I'll show you one creative and then skip through. We have been patiently trying to apply out of home, uh, married to the core creative. So we first take a creative thought, we make advertising, which is a more recent phenomenon. Uh, we are trying to adhere to new category codes. So in the case of our large pickup, Yodha, which competes with Mahindra's Bolero, it's a distant number two at this point in time. We have changed the category code to make it more macho, to make it more aggressive, to showcase its terrain credentials because nobody gets into brochureware and spec to spec comparison. So first you make the advertising, then you take it to a large canvas. Let me play this ad for you. Badal bijli barsat ho ya dhungli kali. Sorry, my bad. This I'll play this one. This is the Yoda. That was the intra. In the interest of time, let me play this one. Bhaiya, bridge, cement, school tak kaise pochega? Waha tak agar shiksha pochh sakti hai, to school ke liye cement kyun nahi? Yoda hai na? So we are trying to show terrain, we are trying to show gradability, we are trying to show load carrying capacity. In this business, every drop of fuel matters, every centimeter of deck length matters, every hundred rupees that increases in terms of EMI payment matters. But at the end of the day, they want to be proud of the vehicle that they drive. They want to have aspirational values attached to that vehicle. Once we do that, we take this messaging across whether it is hoardings, whether it is digital advertising, whether it is attribution-rich form fill media, we just try and place this at relevant points and we are doing that programmatically. I'll skip through this. 
each facet and feature has to be presented like one facet on a diamond because if you're talking about two things at the same time, the vehicle does not get addressed as one lump sum. People are interested, mileage kitna milta hai, deck length kitni hai, turning radius kitna hai. But you can't showcase all of that in one outdoor hoarding or in one ad. So we try and break it patiently as far as we can and I don't think we are quite to Sam's prescription in terms of having five words, etc. And that's a training I got as well very early on. This business is different. L left to its own devices, we would end up having a share prospectus here. So we are much better than what we intended to be, but we are still on the journey of making it sharper. Let me show you one interesting uh, campaign that we did. Some of my colleagues who are in the, in the room today have, have done this. Uh, you know, there are safety features, there are technical features which people don't understand. So we decided, let the brand get promoted out of home and print, but let the technical feature be sold through storytelling. So let me show you this ad. Driver sahab ki aankhon pe nazar rakhna hamara kaam hai, hamari duty hai. Jaise hi driver sahab ko neend aayegi, और अगर दोबारा नींद आई तो ये पागल क्या? पर कुछ भी हो जाए ड्राइवर साहब को नींद नहीं ट्रक्स लाए हैं ड्राइवर मॉनिटरिंग सिस्टम ड्राइवर की जरा सी भी आंख लगने पर अलार्म बजकर उसे जगा देता है ताकि आपका ट्रक हमेशा सेफ रहे अब सेफ्टी होगी और भी ज्यादा टाटा ट्रक्स देश के ट्रक्स नाउ इवन इफ वन लाइफ इज सेव्ड ऑन द रोड दैट्स अ वेरी वर्दी थिंग टू एडवर्टाइज बट इट्स आल्सो एक्चुअली अ वेरी इफेक्टिव मींस एंड देयर आर अ होस्ट ऑफ टेक्निकल इनपुट्स टू व्हीकल्स व्हिच कॉज लेस फटीग व्हिच टेक यू सेफर व्हिच कैन ट्रैक एंड ट्रेस greater number of trips so the reason i am showing you advertising in an oh uh, uh, forum is i don't see them as divorced i see them as together so the messaging has to be led by one and elaborated in a myriad number of ways through other means oh being primary for us now state specific campaigns we must take care of context because what works in andhra is very different from what works in assam so so far as possible we have tried to embellish it we have tried to superscript it we have tried to go across a variety of languages uh, same is true for category dynamics between passenger cv passenger vehicles cargo vehicles mining tippers one is not the same as other and these are very highly involved purchases a top end truck would cost you 50 60 lakh or rupees the advertising will only bring it to the front of the mind it's not going to do the deal by itself so a lot of that negotiation happens across the table and at that time when my dealer sales executive or the territory sales manager is sitting and negotiating on a on a on a deal or with a fleet owner or a tender with a state road transport corporation this positivity must exist in their mind now one of the re other reasons i prefer out of home advertising is because people keep worrying about what's changing in consumer lives uh, marketers must be interested in what is not changing what is remaining constant because if you build on that you're on good foundation so now i'll skip through the rest of this portion very quickly yes we are doing data and logic we are doing it programmatically we want to build the right context the right framework we want to understand the customer touch points because my business is different where do truck drivers congregate they are at nakas at transport nagars at union stands at uh, places where they play octroi they are at road barriers where do they drive they drive night and day so what we see conventionally as out of home advertising is a very different world where the truck driver is concerned and we are addressing truck drivers but we are also addressing fleet owners financiers shipment shippers or shipment providers and also the logistics universe because a large number of trucks are being sold as captive trucks to corporate owners say an amazon or a flipkart would buy thousands of mini trucks we want to be able to tell them 
at the right places and remind them at the right places as well. We are doing uh, audience insights through a variety of ways, but I think the largely the four or five filters in the last year since, and we did a pitch uh, uh, as well, Sam. So the, the, the criteria was, do people apply the right filters on a heat map to say, where is the fuel station? Where is the octroi booth? Where is the, the large C and FA hub? Where does warehousing happen? Where are the arterial roads? Where are the sub roads? You know, every time I go back, I live in Parel, when I go back from the airport, uh, unmindful of Google Maps, the driver always asks me, Main dhara bhi se lu ya dadar se I, this is like the, one, of the, one of the toughest questions for humanity to answer, it seems. Every third day he asks me this. Because in his mind, taking a side route is actually more effective because it might actually take a longer time uh, or longer distance, but he does not have to exert the effort of waiting or navigating through thick traffic. So the consumer rationale for navigating traffic or traveling a longer distance is very different from a programmatic rationale for deciding. Google wants you to reach in the shortest time, but my driver wants to go with ease and comfort. So there is a critical difference. Uh, I think we will we will already be fairly educated about the data layers. I think what is important for me um, is the planned campaign has to rest on identified target group movement. Where do people come together and where do they branch out from? Yesterday I was in Bangalore and uh, from Whitefield, my driver took me through a state road uh, on Hos uh, the, they, he called it the Hoscourt Road. And I saw two of our large hoardings. Uh, and I was very happy because that's the road which all the cargo movements happening before they get onto the main highway. One going to Kolar and the other going back to uh, Bangalore and onwards to Hosur. That's the kind of placement that's important to us. Uh, Mandis, toll nakas, the kind of places you've never been to. That's where my business gets done. We've been doing this heat, heat mapping for customer connections. The more the density, the greater the placement logic, but also the flow. So it is a combination of where they are and how they move, both, not only one. Uh, we are using tech in, in villages. We have a program called Neve. Uh, in three states, in the south, in Telangana, in Karnataka, and in AP, we have moved both trying to place things digitally, but also wall wraps where the, the Neve, the foundation rural sales promoter, has an opportunity to showcase our product and immediately do solicitation. So the, the, the form fill sits very close to the stimulus being absorbed because in villages it's not very contested and I think, uh, Sam, my view is that rural is another great opportunity because now with road connectivity the way it is, uh, you know, I think transits will be much thicker, traffics will be, traffic movement will be much thicker and this hub and spoke arrangement between proximate rural geographies uh, and big cities will increase. Uh, I grew up in Rajasthan, there was a concept of a village or gaon, then kasba or a small mufasil location and then sheher. Now it's kind of seamless, you know, between the small village and of course digital has reached everywhere. So I think that's another area that we must pay close attention to. Uh, so in ending, why do we as in Tata Motors, commercial vehicles do outdoors, but also in my individual capacity, why do I believe in it? One is, like I said, it plays a critical role in creating impact and increasing brand awareness. And I don't think brands should be subjected only to the stencil of an Excel sheet. Brands have to create magic. It has to then work via logic, not the other way around. If you started building um, brands purely on logic, we would all need a PhD in computational theory to arrive at great brands. Uh, and some of the greatest brands in this world have got built in the period between the two wars, when there was no digital, and I think outdoor and print were the uh, oldest and heaviest used media back then as well. Uh, I'm not a Luddite and I'm not so old that I should uh, have nostalgia for a period between the wars, but I, what a point I'm trying to make is let's not try and put immediacy in front of uh, importance. This is a commonly made mistake across brands. 
The second thing is we can marry data and insights with creative. But this big data piece has to lead to big insights. You know, when the Titanic sank, there were 10,000 data points which were being monitored from boiler pressure to number of people who have eaten their food, etc., etc. The only one data point that was critical was that in the dark night there is an iceberg ahead. And that's the data point that they missed and the rest is history. So I have great respect for data, but I think we must also be mindful of how to lift the brand to greater and greater heights. And in that there has to be a conspiracy, a collaboration, I would say a conspiracy between the right brain and the left brain, between the creatives and the analysts, between the digital voters and the traditional media voters. If we do that, we'll be in a better place as an industry, as a universe of brands, and certainly out of home will grow by leaps and bounds in this country. Thank you very much for your time.